In this video, we're going to introduce Euler's formula, an extremely useful tool for working with complex numbers. So our objectives are to both introduce Euler's formula and then to use Euler's formula to work with complex numbers in both polar and rectangular coordinate systems. So Euler's formula states that E raised to the power of j theta, where again j is the square root of minus 1, is equal to the cosine of theta plus j times the sine of theta. This looks like a somewhat surprising result, but it's extremely powerful. You can prove that this formula is true by substituting the power series representations for the exponential as well as that for the cosine and the sine. Now Euler's formula gives us another way of thinking about a complex number, and that is as a vector which has a magnitude and an angle. So here I've depicted a point x in the complex plane having a real component and an imaginary component, and if I assume the distance from the point x to the origin is 1 and the angle is theta, then simple trigonometry tells me that the length of the component on the real axis is cosine of theta and the length of the component on the vertical axis or the imaginary component is sine of theta. So I can write x as cosine theta, the real part, plus j times the sine of theta. By Euler's formula, this is equal to 1 times e to the j theta, and I've explicitly written out the 1 here to indicate the magnitude. So in this form, we express the point in polar coordinates as a magnitude, or a distance from the origin, and an angle with respect to the positive real axis. Now it's really important to learn to think in both polar and rectangular coordinates. I know that your calculator can manipulate complex numbers, but if you're going to develop insight, then you have to be able to think in terms of both polar and rectangular coordinates. So in the previous slide, we had a point x that was unit distance from the origin. If I make that point a distance r from the origin and at an angle of theta, then my real part is r cosine theta, my imaginary part is r sine theta, and I can express x in polar coordinates as r, in other words, the magnitude or the length of the vector from the origin to the point x, e to the j theta, where theta, again, is the angle or the phase of x with respect to the positive real axis. A writing x in terms of real and an imaginary term in rectangular coordinates, I have a plus jb. And since x is the same number, that implies that the real part, or a, is r cosine theta, and the imaginary part, or b, is r sine theta. If I'm given the number in terms of rectangular coordinates, that is, I know a and b, then I can find r as the magnitude of this number, which is going to be the square root of a squared plus b squared, and I can find the angle by taking the arctangent of the ratio of the imaginary part, or b, divided by the real part, or a. When you're finding the angle, you need to use a four-quadrant arctangent. So if both a and b are negative, then we know we're in the third quadrant, and the ratio of b over a would have the same sign as if we were in the first quadrant. So you have to pay attention to which quadrant you're in to correctly find the angle theta. So let's take a little example here where I let x be equal to 2 e to the j 3 pi over 4. So this is a point in the complex plane that has distance 2, so it's distance of 2 units from the origin, and the angle with respect to the positive real axis is 3 pi over 4. If we convert to the rectangular coordinates, or the components along the real axis and the imaginary axis, we find that on the real axis we have the negative square root of 2, and that corresponds to 2 cosine 3 pi over 4, and on the imaginary axis, we have the square root of 2, which is 2 sine 3 pi over 4. So I've expressed the complex number in polar form, 2 e to the j 3 pi over 4, as a number in rectangular coordinates, square root of 2 plus j square root of 2. And you can check that this works out by going from the rectangular coordinates back to the polar coordinates, 
If I check the magnitude, r, the distance from the origin, I have the negative square root of 2 squared, which is 2, plus the square root of 2 squared, which is 2. So that sum is 4, and the square root of that is 2. And taking the 4 quadrant arc tangent, I'm going to have the ratio of the square root of 2, which is the imaginary term, divided by negative square root of 2, which is the component on the real axis. This ratio is negative 1. That corresponds to an angle with respect to the positive real axis of 3 pi over 4. Now, the complex conjugate is a very simple interpretation in terms of these polar coordinates. So if x is a number r e to the j theta, I can write that in rectangular coordinates as r cosine theta plus j sine theta. That's this point that I've indicated in the complex plane at distance r from the origin and angle theta from the positive real axis. We obtain the complex conjugate by changing the sine of j. Everywhere we see a j, we replace that by minus j. In polar coordinates, I have r e to the minus j theta is the conjugate of x. So this number has the same magnitude, but the angle now is negative theta with respect to the real axis. So that puts us down here at distance r from the origin to have x conjugate. And you can check in rectangular coordinates that, indeed, what has happened is the real part has stayed the same, and the imaginary part has changed its sign. So instead of being at plus r sine theta, I'm now at minus r sine theta. If you multiply x times its complex conjugate, it's very easy to do in polar coordinates. So I'll write x as r e to the j theta. I'll write x complex conjugate as r e to the minus j theta. The product is r squared, and then the terms in the exponents add. So I have theta minus theta, which is 0, and e to the 0 is 1. So I have r squared for x times x complex conjugate. In contrast, it's much easier to add numbers in rectangular coordinates. Here, if I take x plus x conjugate, that's going to be the sum of this number plus this number, you can see that the imaginary components should cancel out, and the real part should be twice the real part of x. And indeed, by substituting the rectangular coordinate expression for x and x conjugate, we do get exactly twice the real part of x, or 2 times little r cosine theta. So with arithmetic operations, it's generally much easier to do addition and subtraction in terms of rectangular coordinates, both the actual computation as well as the mental visualization of what that means for adding or subtracting complex numbers. In contrast, multiplication and division is much easier both to perform and to understand in polar coordinates. We'll take a simple example here. If x is 1 minus 2j and y is 3 plus j, I can write x as 1 on the real axis and minus 2 on the imaginary axis, so that's this point here, and y is going to be 3 on the real axis and 1 on the imaginary axis, or this point here. So if I add these two, you can see that all I have to do is add the real parts and the imaginary parts to give me 4 minus j. Graphically, we can do this like we're adding vectors. We take one vector representing x, and we take the vector representing y and put its tail at the head of x. x plus y is this term here. We've got our y vector added to our x vector, and that puts us at this point, which turns out to also be 4 minus j, as it should be. Now, if we're going to do multiplication in an example, we'll take z as 2 e to the minus j pi over 4 and w as 3 e to the j 2 pi over 3. So z is distance 2 from the origin and angle minus pi over 4 with respect to the positive real axis. So that's this point right here. And w is distance 3 from the origin and angle 2 pi over 3 with respect to the positive real axis, or this point here. So if I take the product of z times w, you can write that using the polar coordinate expression for z and w, and we see that the magnitudes multiply, so I have 2 times 3, and then the phases that are in the exponent, those sum, so I have e to the j 
2 pi over 3 minus pi over 4, and they end up with 5 pi over 12. So when we multiply numbers in polar coordinates, we multiply the magnitudes and we sum the angles or the phases of those numbers. In contrast, if we were going to multiply numbers in rectangular coordinates, we would have to do the FOIL procedure to account for all the terms. And you can make use of this polar coordinate expression, which originated in Euler's formula, to do some things that would be difficult to do in rectangular coordinates. For example, if x is r e to the j theta, and I want to find out what x raised to the nth power is, that's very easy to do in polar coordinates, because I take x and I raise it to the nth power. Bringing the n inside the parentheses means that r is raised to the nth power, and my exponent becomes multiplied by n. So r e to the j theta raised to the nth power has magnitude r to the n and phase n times theta. I said that working in polar coordinates can lead to some very useful insight for certain types of problems, and using Euler's formula in particular. I want to do that with some examples that I frequently run into with students. So suppose you're confronted with the number e to the j pi over 2. And it can be confusing, like, well, what is that number? Well, think about this number as being in polar coordinates. The magnitude is 1. There's nothing written here, so the out front is 1. And the phase is pi over 2. So if I identify a point that is distance 1 from the origin and an angle pi over 2 with respect to the positive real axis, I see that e to the j pi over 2 is nothing more than j. And if you expanded e to the j pi over 2 in terms of cosine pi over 2 plus j sine pi over 2, since cosine pi over 2 is 0 and sine pi over 2 is 1, you would come to the same conclusion. But it's very easy to see this graphically, and I strongly encourage you to draw pictures of complex numbers in the complex plane, it'll give you a lot more insight and understanding. So another example is e to the j pi. Well, this also has unit magnitude, and it has phase angle pi with respect to the real axis. So that's a point located here. I've got distance of 1 from the origin, and my phase angle pi with respect to the real axis. And clearly, that point is on the real axis, and the coordinate there is at minus 1. So e to the j pi is simply minus 1. By the same argument, e to the minus j pi is the exact same point. So that's also going to be minus 1. So looking at the number in the complex plane immediately reveals to us what the correct value is. Uh, one last example. Let's suppose we have e to the negative j 3 pi over 2. Again, I've got magnitude of unity. So this is a number that's distance 1 from the origin. And the angle is negative 3 pi over 2. So it's 3 pi over 2 radians in the negative direction with respect to the real axis. We swing around and we see that that number is on the positive imaginary axis. So this number is exactly j, which is what we had for e to the j pi over 2. And of course, going pi over 2 with respect to the positive real axis and negative 3 pi over 2 leads us to the same point. Euler's formula is extremely powerful for working with complex numbers. Using it to express numbers in polar coordinates is very, very useful. I strongly encourage you to use the complex plane and graph these numbers to develop your insight and understanding.